officially. Karl Marx died in 1883, but when you look around, the spirit of Marx seems to be undeniably alive. With Marx's name being emblazoned at the forefront of every political cycle, every Fox News broadcast, and every godforsaken Ben Shapiro video. Since the fall of the Berlin Wall and the disintegration of communism, the ghost of Marx has been apparent. From Francis Fukuyama's proclamation that history has ended, to Thatcher's, there is no alternative slogan. The recent trends of neoliberal capitalism appear to be an implicit denial of the ghost of Marx which in of itself is a resignation to the haunting of Marx over modern society, with his ideas casting a shadow over past and future iterations of neoliberal political formations. We can see other ghosts similar to Marx sees us in history. For example, the ghost of an idealized American past, memorialized in the red polyester of a Make America Great Again hat, where this idea of a lost mythological America as more similar to utopia than a real historical time in America haunts the present. This concept of a lost past, of a memorialized history that haunts us today, is incredibly important to understand, and the haunting of an idealized American history is something the left will have to grapple with. As Marx says, The tradition of all the generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. And just as they seem to be occupied with revolutionizing themselves and things, creating something that did not exist before, precisely in such epochs of revolutionary crisis, they anxiously conjure up the spirits of the past to their service. However, even in recognizing this concept of the past haunting the present, or what philosopher Jacques Derrida coins ontology, an aspect of ontology that has not been analyzed is crip ontology or the specter of disability that operates as an idle apparition, only animated by the individual caught in between, by the disabled subject that finds themselves in the area between death and life. In applying the concept of ontology to disability, it becomes clear the latent ghost of the broken body shares a kinship with Marx, with the ghosts of modernity. Disability haunts society, casting a shadow over our social formations and institutions that is simultaneously ignored, as if disability was not present at all, while also being shoved to the forefront, with the shadow of disability being located into every structure, into the settings of each city, with the implicit acknowledgement of ignorance, turning a blind eye to the wheelchair, to the cane, and to the ABA therapist constituting disability as a ghost that is so alive, but also finds itself as a dead entity, unable to speak with its own voice. However, we first need a deeper dive into Derrida's theory, and to go earlier into Derrida's thought in order to properly examine this idea of a crip ontology. At the forefront of Derrida's thought is his conception of binary oppositions which, in its most straightforward explanation, is the idea that in binaries, such as light-dark or center-periphery, each term in the binary is defined by the opposing term. We define lightness for the absence of darkness, and we define the center by locating it in contrast of the periphery. In addition to this, is Derrida's argument that in these binaries, terms are privileged over one another implicitly, rendering a single term primary and another secondary. So, using the previous examples, lightness is privileged over darkness, and the sensor is privileged over the periphery. We see this rather easily here, but in the interest of setting up this concept of crip ontology, let's take another binary, disability, ability. In the same way we see lightness be defined by the absence of darkness, ability is also defined by the absence of disability. And through this absence, disability then holds power over the able-bodied other through the defining of ability. In other words, because disability defines ability through its absence, disability holds a power over the able-bodied collective that acts as an ideological control, constricting and expanding the boundaries of both the center and periphery through the changing social definitions of disability, which in turn changes the social definition of ability. However, Despite this relationship between disability and ability and the power imbued into that relationship, disability is also obviously considered secondary to ability, with ability being privileged above disability in the oppositional binary, thus making the power of disability one that has vanished from sight. 
we can perhaps best see this in the phenomenon of the rejection and acceptance of individuals for disability checks. Constituting these individuals as disabled or able-bodied on the basis of arbitrary guidelines. Constricting or expanding the definition of disability based on the logic of capital or the state. And this fluid defining of disability then impacts how we view ability as individuals who would have been institutionalized 50 years ago are now no longer viewed as disabled, but rather as individuals insofar that they participate in their system of labor, normalizing what was formerly disability as what is now ability or able-bodiedness. This fluid defining of disability exists as an active threat towards the non-disabled other, forcing them into production through the fear of disability, with disability acting as an ideological control that emerges as the death of the individual, as a constitutive loss where your identity is fundamentally eradicated due to disabled subject's existence on the periphery, banished outside the system of wage labor and a symbolic exchange of cultural capitalism. This defining of ability by disability, and vice versa, acts to push able-bodied individuals into the system of wage exploitation they occupy, as it emerges as impossible for them to develop an identity outside of their role as sources of labor, with, as mentioned before, disability being rendered a constitutive lack due to their existence on the periphery, outside of the machine of labor. This potential expulsion from the system of wage labor via acquired disability haunts the able-bodied individual and pushes them into capitalist ideology. With this understanding of oppositional binaries, we can now move on to the primary idea of Derrida's that I want to dissect, his theory of hauntology. Hauntology is a concept that arose at a specific historical context. It was the moment after the Soviet Union dissolved and a post-ideological round was declared with Margaret Thatcher coining her slogan of there is no alternative to a market economy in conjunction with the emergence of the thesis by Fukuyama that the failure of communism in Eastern Europe signified the end of history, that laissez-faire market capitalism would be the last economic development in history, and that conflicts of an ideological basis, such as the Red Scare, would subside of liberal democracy becoming the final form of human government. It is out of this notion of an end of history, of a capitalist realism, that Derrida's idea of ontology emerges. Ontology, in its simplest explanation, is the concept that the present is being haunted by the past, with the shared history of humanity acting as the master of the puppet strings of the future through the usage of ghosts, specters of the past that can never quite go away. Rather than this concept of ontology merely being a historical force that drives present day processes, these ghosts also pervade our own consciousnesses, the psychologies of you and me, haunting our perceptions of the world and how we conceive the future. This is where Derrida's poeticism comes in. You see, in Derrida's native French, the H in ontology is silent, being pronounced identically to the word ontology which is the study of the nature of being, of how we create categories and become ourselves. Through the silent H, there's the acknowledgement that ontology is also ontological. It constitutes, creates our worlds, and impacts our processes of becoming. It was an example that was used in the very start of this video, and it is also the one that Derrida uses perhaps most frequently, but Marx and Marxism as a ontology is one of the best examples of the concept. We see this today in our modern politics, at least in America. The mainstream left often feels the need to deny Marx, to distance themselves from any notion of post-capitalism. They do so in fashions that lend themselves towards mediocrity, to a political philosophy that advocates for a ghoulish austerity, with the Democratic Party often appearing more similar to a vehicle that's spinning its wheels into the ground, rather than an ambitious party of the working class. And a lot of this can be traced back to the ghost of Marx and the ensuing desire to exercise him for their collected denial of socialism and their embrace of mediocre, gradual reforms. On the other hand, conservatives seek to exercise the ghost of Marx through raising him up and striking him down, establishing caricatures of socialism through the pinning of the communist label upon any and every center-left politician, which pushes a ontology where Marx is still an enemy that must be defeated, despite the pretense of our post-ideological world our capitalist realism, and the assumed end of history. 
Ghosts of Marx and the attempts of exorcism haunts our politics. And, as Mark Fisher would say, cancels the future, as it attempts to bring back the conflicts of the past, rather than bring us towards new futures, new forms of politics, or struggle. Today's politics mirrors the 1970s, where conservatives still must defeat the spirit of Marxism, the specter of the USSR as symbolized hilariously by scapegoats such as Biden and Pelosi, reproducing Cold War rhetoric of defeating communism 50 years later, as opposed to creating new forms of political struggle. The future has been cancelled, and all that remains is the ontological, the battles of the past that endlessly loop in modern civilization, fighting ghosts that have seemed to have always already existed. Marx is no longer a historical figure, a philosopher or political theorist, but a specter whose purpose is to replay the same conflicts in an effort to delay the future. This ontology was framed from a solely political angle, but we can also see this in culture, and it wrote around us through music, TV, film, in Joy Division, and The Shining. We see the past repeat itself in a loop, haunting our art in narrative form, leaving the future as unattainable with the music of the 80s being recycled into the music of the 2020s, playing into the same feedback loop of hauntology we observed in our modern politics. Through this cancellation of the future, through the neglect of a political ambition and the replacement of art with the recycling of the past, we enter into a hauntology portrayed in dystopias such as Children of Men, where the future becomes a thing of the past. Perhaps it is what Derrida says, to haunt does not mean to be present, and it is necessary to introduce haunting into the very construction of a concept. That is what we would be calling here a hauntology. Ontology opposes it only in a movement of exorcism. Ontology is a conjuration. The absence of disability in turn constitutes a hauntology, a spectrality that emerges as an absent presence, constructing a conceptualization of the disability-ability binary. Alright, so I can already see you asking. Okay, hauntology essentially establishes that historical movements and figures can act as form of deconstruction on the present, with Marx haunting the present as a past figure and so on. However, the title of this video is Crip Ontology. Disability was connected with these ideas of Derrida, and disability isn't dead. Disability can't die, right? Well, this is perhaps true in some ways. Disability is unlike Marx in that there is no death of Marxism in terms of the Berlin Wall crashing down or the Soviet Union dissolving. I argue that disability has had, in fact, multiple deaths. Historically, disability is the moral or genetic failure has died giving way to the social model of disability and the modern advent of disability accommodations and supports, leading us into modern efforts of disability emancipation through movements like neurodiversity or disability rights movements. It is in this death, however, that the ghost of disability still haunts the able-bodied, that the pretense of these modern disability movements are but an illusion, giving way to a crip ontology that bleeds from the disabled periphery into the able-bodied center of society. First, however, is to go back, once again, very quickly into the fundamentals. What is neurodiversity? What do I mean by disability rights movements? Put it plainly, neurodiversity is the movement that says that autism and other similar divergencies from a normative neurology should be considered a difference rather than a deficit or a pathology. That autism is a mode of being, a culture, a neurological ethnography, and that to eliminate autism or neurodivergencies for the finding of a cure would amount to something resembling a genocide, a elimination of a cultural identity from the possibilities of human experience. Thus, neurodiversity speaks out against groups seeking to cure autism, advocating for autism and autistic people to be viewed as just neurological difference rather than a pathology that medicine seeks to treat. This neurodiversity movement emerges from the disability rights movement of the 90s. In the 90s, disability rights activists, in addition to the well-known five for universal accommodations and supports, also fought for something that is called the social model of disability. The social model of disability, boiled down to its essence, is the idea that disabilities themselves are not the problem. It is the ableist society that surrounds the disability that is the problem. So, rather than seeking to institutionalize the individual with disabilities or to force a deaf person into using cochlear implants due to society's insistence via the medical model of disability, 
that disabilities deficit or something to be overcome. A social model of disability would instead respond with the idea of accommodations or universal design, arguing that we should structure our societies in such a way to where everyone, regardless of disability, is able to participate fully. Here we can see the intersection of neurodiversity and the social model of disability. They both apply the idea that disability should be considered as a difference, rather than a deficit. The issue here, as elaborated in Derrida's conception of ontology, is that while we may block out the past from memory, and pretend that history is sequestered away and a past that will never arise or come to fruition again, the truth is that the past bleeds into the present, making its presence felt, haunting our current moment as a spectrality. The mass institutionalization of people with disabilities, the medical model of disability that views disability as something to cure rather than a cultural and political identity, none of this goes away despite the advancements we have made. The ghost of disability as a deficit does more than lurk in a shadow. It bleeds in from the margins into the center as a ghost. What does this bleeding in from the margin amount to? What does the spectrality of disability as a deficit signify? Here, cryptontology works both ways. It constitutes the mode of being, the lives of both the able-bodied individual and the disabled subject. Cryptontology does so through its presence in an ableist society that illusions itself as progressive, in turn constituting disability as anachronistic or outside of time, belonging to the never-changing image of the wheelchair, of the cane, or of the idiot with the disabled subject being located in a site of broken time, held in a stasis by an image of disability that is rendered always already existing, being an entity that is placed almost outside of time itself. Simply, the image of disability is time out of joint. Disability is death that is held in limbo, the suspension of cessation that is frozen in time, and thus encapsulates Hamlet's ghost, or Mark Augus, the non-place. The places that resemble one another more so than the spaces that they are located in, and whose pervasiveness only hints at the inevitable spread of capitalist globalization. Could the same not be said of disability? Is it not true that the disabled subject is constituted more so as a structure than as a person, the object imbued into a setting or backdrop, and thus resembles each other more than they resemble the locations the disabled object occupies? And what object encapsulates capitalist globalization more so than the disabled subject, the exploited non-present that performs as an object of profit? It is in this that the disabled subject perhaps throws time most out of joint, as they are the absent present, the subject that is signified by its non-subjectivity, and this positioning of the disabled subject as in-between, located in the gray areas of phenomenology, is what constitutes the haunting of the able-bodied other, this crip hauntology. It is as Alan Hawkinson says, the ghost of disability was forced to wander the boundary of life and death, presence and absence, truth and illusion, being and non-being, whilst cadaver was rendered, as in a childlike dream. Disability is frozen, caught in the boundary in between life and death, while also being presented for the schema of the market as a threat for the able-bodied individual, and thus performs as a hauntology, a spectrality where the disabled individual operates more so as a ghost than a subject. Their subjectivity is deprived from them because of disability being atemporal, being frozen in time through the object fetishization of disability, being constituted as a never changing image of the cane or of the wheelchair, and this freezing of time presents a delayed death, as if the disabled body was merely a preserved corpse. Repontology's impact is not sequestered to the disabled. Arguably, its biggest impact is as a specter of the market, as a haunting of the worker. Here, disability exists as a threat of what may come if the able-bodied worker stops being productive, that if the worker withholds their value to capital in the form of various resistances, whether that be a strike or unionization effort, the same ontology that affects the individual with disability will come down on the worker, and this crip ontology embodies a death for the able-bodied worker.
It is through the hauntology that the worker is forced towards the same cycles of labor. The same cycles of alienation, because to do anything else but be a conqueror capital would signify a similar spectrality, where the non-productive subject is frozen in time, with the absence of productivity signifying a delayed death, an existence in the margins that is stuck in between being and non-being. Through the very real fear of the worker of becoming disabled and thus ceding their value to the system of capital, crip hauntology doubles upon its impact as the ghost of disability haunts the worker into the system of labor they occupy, keeping the worker in the relations of exploitation to make the capitalist system function, while ensuring that no disruption of that capitalist status quo happens via a mechanism of fear, through the fear of disability via crip hauntology. This means that crip hauntology engages in a double repression. It both represses the disabled subject it represents through the constitutive temporal freezing of disability, while also repressing the able-bodied individual through its usage as an element of fear in a postmodern neoliberal society. Now, this is generally the point in a video where I turn on a dime and try and shift the mood of the video by prescribing some sort of solution, some reason for optimism that the issue being discussed may be overcome in some way. However, this is not a typical video for me. It strikes me that, absent some upheaval in our economic system, that this crip ontology has no realistic outcome where it subsides through some sort of reform or social movement. To put it bluntly, there is no light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to crip ontology. As long as the relations of labor that is present under capitalism remains constant, the same dynamic will persist. Disability will be constituted as atemporal. This atemporal disability will then be utilized as an element of fear to drive the worker even further into the system of alienation, particular to capitalism. And all of this will continue to become a self-feeding cycle of ableism with no end in sight. Perhaps I am overly pessimistic, but this is the disabled condition, and this is where it leaves us. Out of joint, frozen in the boundaries that are in between, caught wandering between presence and absence, rendered a corpse that is held in stasis until its being ceases to exist. Perhaps it is as Slavoj Žižek says, that the escapes we perceive to be the light at the end of the proverbial tunnel is actually just an oncoming train.